that's um, Dale's mother called Pauline. Very attractive young lady in her high school graduation class. I don't know what the symbols, what the letters mean, and I had not seen that picture until I think his brother William showed it to me many, many years later. She married soon thereafter. She was brought up in a uh, in a Catholic school mm -hmm. in Bucharest. That picture only came to light recently as Moreno's father, and it came to hand because it was left in uh, among the pictures that William left when he died, and his son, their son Joe, sent it to me, and. As a matter of fact, he was a very absent husband and father. It is known, William told me, that he started another family somewhere. We don't, he did, they didn't pursue that. They don't know whether it was in Bulgaria or in Turkey, because he traveled there. And he never adjusted to the Western world. He especially couldn't adjust to the German culture. He was very unhappy, didn't feel at home there. And that was a fiasco when they moved to Chemnitz. There is J.L. I'm not quite sure. He didn't m seem to know what age he was. The only thing that strikes me about that picture is how much Jonathan resembled him as a baby. And when I brought uh, Jonathan, when he was about five months old, to see his mother because she couldn't travel anymore in Long Island where she was living, she almost fainted at the sight of him. She so excited, and she said he looked exactly like his father as a baby. He had that same kind of shaped face, and the look in his eyes. There he is, 12 years old. Unfortunately, that picture got badly cracked. Um, I think that was the time when he had the malaria when they went to Turkey. His father took him to Turkey. I don't know if it was 9, 10, 11, but I suspect he's a little older at this age because of the way he stands and wearing a hat. But I can't be sure. I don't know if there's any indication on the back of the picture what the age is. But this is him as a very uh, preteen or early teen. Yeah, there he is in the medical unit in the Tyro Tyrolean group that he um, was part of, medi of the medical group. Those were nurses, and uh, this was during the First World War, probably taken in Hungary, because that's where he was in a field hospital for quite a while. He, he mixed it up in his autobiography that he wasn't much in the war, but he, I think he wanted to forget that period. Here he's doing um, anesthesiology, and he told me, that surgeon was really a butcher. He didn't know what he was doing. He was pouring all the right, wrong kinds of chemicals into people's, into the men's brains. He killed them, and he hated that period. I think that was one of the reasons he never referred to these pictures. Mm -hmm. Well, there he is in his um, poetic existential period in Vienna again, later, and uh, with his pork pie hat. I'm particularly fond of this picture. I think. It very well expresses who he was at the time. And it's interesting that he wears his collar like this, almost like a helmet, as if his head is separate from his body. Um, yeah, very interesting picture, I think. Beautiful young man. There he is in the gardens in Vaslau. This is a picture I also had never seen until uh, some students in... Uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Weiser's department began to study Moreno's presence in Faslav, and this picture came to light. And that was during the period before he came to America, when he was working on both his ideas and on the magnetic recording machine that actually brought him to America. It had uh, was done on very fine uh, steel, and it had pictures on one side and sound on the other. It was really well before 
recording became an established production in this country. And in fact, he was for two years in a place called Elyria, Ohio, working at a gramophone company. They heard, they had an, they had, in 1924, they had an exhibit in Vienna of theater techniques where they had seen this. It was reported in the New York Times, and that's how he came to this country, not as a physician, but as an engineer for this company. There he is with his younger brother, William, who was his best friend, his greatest supporter and admirer, and adored him. When Moreno died, <laughs> William said to his wife, I should have died first. And she, she said, but why? You are the younger. He said, no, I should have died first. Uh, by which he meant, I can't live without him. He died not long after, not after Moreno died. No. Well, there is Moreno sitting on this lovely third step, third level, third level that has now been omitted because of the, of the height of the building couldn't absorb it. And this is where he sat when he began to work and warm up the group on the lower level, but with his, him <coughs> seating on the top level, which in a way might have d uh, uh, replicated his sitting on the tree when he was telling stories. Mm -hmm. into the children in the gardens of Vienna. But that was his um, favorite position. Where was that? This was done in November 41 by Life magazine. We were supposed to have a spread in Life magazine and then came Pearl Harbor and it washed all that out. But a lot of the pictures we were given and this was this one, one of them. Um, was it in Beacon? The, the stage? Oh yeah, this is the Beacon stage. The Beacon. See. That's why I mentioned the third level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think he posed for that for some report on his work. He loved reading anyway, so he was perfectly happy to be seen reading a book. It was always made him, I mean, he read a lot, he had extensively. Magazine, and news magazines, newspa two newspapers, I mean, besides his scientific or philosophical material, he read a great deal. It looks a little stern here. I'm not sure just why. Um, this is a later picture. I, my suspicion is that he didn't like sitting for a picture. He liked to be taken when he was m moving, like with his hands, in action. Um, I think it kept him a little bit aloof. Mm -hmm. when he had to sit for a picture. Yeah. Well, this is an interesting picture because this was taken by the husband of a student of ours who was a student of Carl Rogers. And this was the time Moreno was invited by Carl Rogers at the University of Chicago in 1948. And this was one of the series of pictures. The other one is also with me with the white beret on. And, um, Margarita MacDonald, in fact, wrote an article in our magazine at the time, in our journal, comparing her experience with Rogers and Moreno dealing with the same problem. And that is still, that's there forever, that evidence. Mm -hmm. um, as you saw, I had a lot of hair. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's taken at the same time by that same photographer. I actually like this picture better, and I think it's better balanced with the hat on. Um, it was a good time in Moreno's life. It was when he was being uh, academically more being invited, and the University of Chicago was an important center for that. That was at the time of the um, Life magazine picture, when that got washed out by Pearl Harbor. So that must have been that was in November 41, earlier than the other one. That's, um, this was very interesting. It was also a Life magazine picture, by the way. I am watching, I'm supposed to be the wife, this is an actual case Moreno treated, I'm supposed to be the wife of this man who has found another woman and he's interacting with her on the stage and I'm sitting there, and in one picture, in fact, I'm going with my, my fist like this as if to say, 
get her out of my life. You know? <laughs> I'm not sure what happened to that picture, <clears throat> but that was me watching that horrible event, showing me that I was no number number one in the protagonist's wife, in fact, his life as his wife. Yeah, that was in Hyde Park in. Chicago, when Moreno was invited to speak to a group of ladies in home economics. There's another picture of him where he's surrounded by these ladies. Um, I think that was in 1942, autumn of 1942, and I took that picture of him with my little, you know, uh, simple Kodak camera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that picture. Yeah, that's an action shot taken in Beacon. And you see here, but most people don't realize, the windows were covered up to make this into a real theater, because they had windows there before. And he is explaining psychodrama to people. And I think this is also a Life magazine shot that didn't get pumped, of that article didn't get published. Yeah, we had been to Texas, and he loved Texas. So I don't know whether I bought him that hat or he did. That was in front of our house. Um, under snow or winter, no, no, they don't see the snow. But this little white picket fence went all the way around the house over here, and he loved that hat. I called it the Vien the Viennese uh, Texan. This is another one of those pictures where I think he was a little embarrassed to be sitting, posing for a picture. Um, yeah, that's my favorite mother-child pictures, Jonathan and I. One of my favorites. There's another one where he's, um, and how old is he here? It's before Gretel left, so he's about eight weeks. And at one point in the series of pictures that she took, he grabbed my uh, pearls and he went, oh, and I don't think it was all about the pearls, it was he was getting sleepy, he was yawning. <laughs> so there is another version. Do you have the other version? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, this is remarkable. Uh, um, I don't think he was more than a few months old. The photographer posed him like this, and he stayed like that. And I call it the philosopher, which is what he became. And I was especially intrigued by his eyes. He, I mean, he's he's got the most extraordinary eyes. I think, like very much like his father, very aware. And looking and studying and wondering what is this world about and he became a philosopher i think here we're watching jonathan uh, running in the garden it's out beyond the picture where i know no, enjoying jonathan's um antics you know mm -hmm. her kids are fooling around yeah yeah this is jonathan waving his hand i don't know who took that picture and I'm not quite sure how old he is. I, I, I can't remember quite his age, but um, but he was a nice, you know, a nice looking bright kid. Ah, oh, yeah, I like that one. He just had something to eat. I don't know whether he was enjoying it or not, but you see he scrambled up his face. <laughs> and that's in front of uh, the house. I changed that later on, that whole entry to the house, to make it easier for him, for Moreno, to get in. Um, yeah, that's one of these cute kid pictures, you know, that mm -hmm. we caught him at, an, at a moment where he was making a face. Yeah, this is, um, this is the other side of the garden, the far side. I had the picket fence replaced by this, because we had more privacy. Uh, this is my brother Charles, 16 months old, and I'm a good friend. This is his wife, Anne. And I think Jonathan is about two and a half, two, two and a half years old there. And Marina looking very pleased with himself and the family. Yeah, this is another time, maybe about the same time when that picture was taken. I like that one too. Both of us look happy and smiling. There's Jonathan. Put it had been, but he put on his father's shoes and his father's hat, and here is the mirror, that part of it that reflects it, and he's so pleased with himself because he's, you know, standing in bigger shoes and has on his, his daddy's shoes and his daddy's hat. The implication is, 
I want to follow in my daddy's footsteps but, mm. and wear a big hat like he does. Yeah, I like this picture especially because this this um, piano had just been brought into the house for Regina who was having singing lessons and she had to study music and he scrambled up and set up and played as if he, he'd known all along what the thing was for. Nobody taught him, he just, just up there. In mm. fact, I called it, uh, <coughs> I was trained by Paderewski. I was taught by Paderewski, <laughs> the great Polish pianist. Uh, I don't know if you, if you, if you saw the photographer. One can oh, see am the I photographer. In there? No, yeah. <coughs> but there is... Uh, oh, over here? Yeah. You know the camera in the photographer? Ah. I really don't know who that I is. I think it's me. Can you see my face here? Yeah. Like you? <laughs> no, it's me. I took this picture. Oh, you took <coughs> the picture of the picture? Yeah, exactly. This right is the picture you oh, have sorry. in your room. Oh, right. That's the one in my, in my bedroom and you took the picture of that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. That's a nice one, isn't it? The photographer said, does he ever not smile? And it was, um, we used it on the Christmas card that we made up for everybody. And the staff was very upset that they didn't get one with Jonathan's picture, so we had some more cards printed. <laughs> and uh, he's cute, isn't he, there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there he is. Jonathan's careening around in, on his tricycle. And um, his father stopping him from bumping into him on the piano. He was a great kid. He was a lot of fun. Well, there he is again. Um, I don't know what surprised him, but you see Regina's music up there on the piano. Maybe somebody was coming in. And, and you see some of his playthings up here. Mm -hmm. Giraffe. And here. And some stuff of his on the, on the table. In fact, it had, it, this table had glass on it and he cracked it with one with one of his trucks one day we took the, just took the table the glass off and let it be yeah this was at, at the dining table this was the dun the, at a dinner at a student's wedding where his father stood for in for the for the father of the bride and he made his, his father was making a speech about the young people who were getting married and every once in a while Jonathan, who had never heard his father speak in public, was amazed. And he'd say, every once in a while he'd say, Really, Daddy? I didn't know that, Daddy. And it was so appropriate. Everybody roared with laughter. <laughs> Jonathan making comments about his father's speech. <laughs> Cutie pie, wasn't he? Pretty. Yeah, this was in the garden in Beacon. We rarely had time to sit, so we probably had to pose for a picture <laughs> for that one. Although he know he made another picture, he autographed Maureen's autographing a book. Yeah, that is the wedding at which Jonathan made this speech. Oh, really, Daddy? Oh, Daddy, she was the bride. She was um, an orphan. She only had older sisters. She was from Switzerland, but she was in Moreno's class at NYU, and she asked him. To please to stand up for, in in space in place mm -hmm. of her father, who giveth this woman away, you know. They had four children. Her husband um, John, and she eventually divorced. And um, he intended to write a book about Moreno. I don't know what ever happened to that, but this was at the wedding. This is often verboten. Smoking prohibited. But it was in Argentina, just the same. Because it's Rojas, and this is his wife. And I think this is, I can't, don't recognize some of the other people who are with Moreno, but... <coughs> are, are you sure it was in Argentina? I don't think... <coughs> it could be in Germany. No? It's or German, Austria. Oscar. So where the heck... I, Maybe they came to Vienna at some point, and I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. It's possible. But I remember his wife because she was very vivid, and um, she didn't understand much about psychiatry. I remember that. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. This is Moreno at this um, 
Amsterdam conference and he made some joke. You see, everybody, especially me, laughing. He had the ability to make people laugh. That was wonderful. So this is an international psychiatric conference. And where was that? Don't if I remember. Doesn't tell you over here where it is, huh? Mm -hmm. No. Hmm. We went to so many in all track. <laughs> Think. Se ruega no fumar. That's for mm. Rojas Bermudas. Yeah. Yeah. It could be in Spain. Pan? No, no, no. Or this was in Spain. I think this was Argentina. Argentina. Yeah. Se ruega no fumar. Please don't smoke. Yeah. No, se ruega yeah. no fumar. Yeah. This is still Cuba. Is this a duplication? Which one? This one. <coughs> ah. This man came came to America and studied with us. He brought his family, got out of Cuba and brought his family. And several other people who I can't see from the back now uh, came to us to study. But this is in Cuba? Cuba. You 59, were there? 1959, just after the revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's it. The, um, that uh, maybe had been, but that other... Uh, picture was about the Psychiatric Congress. Um, the American Psychiatric Association and the Cuban Psychiatric Association organized for the Americans to come to Cuba. I guess they didn't want to be isolated. And that was the occasion of the Congress mm -hmm. and Moreno and I gave a demonstration. This is in Hampstead. This got written up. There's a, a magazine article. I mention it in my book. And I was, this man was an alcoholic. This is Dr. Joshua Biro who arranged it in, in his center in Hampstead. Um, and he was declaring to the woman, this woman, me, that this is my brother Charles, by the way, here, sitting in the front row. Um, she tells him that she's in love with him. He said, I can't love you, I'm homosexual. And she said, I don't know what that means. I just love you, she says, that's exactly what she says. <laughs> and my brother and my mother is here somewhere further back. And they both heard it and saw it. And it was the first time they saw me at work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the auxiliary there. Yeah, that's still the same. Him is his double here. The, pro the, the scene was about his mother having died and he n never having admitted to her that he was homosexual. Yeah, and now he he didn't know what to do with this woman who loves him, but whom he couldn't he couldn't love back. Yeah. And here I'm, here I'm, talking about how am I going to explain this to my mother? You are this the, is the, the lady Bird. in I'm the, the double. picture. That's Joshua Bira. That's Moreno. Mm -hmm. I'm being his double. I think this was taken in Czechoslovakia because I remember that outfit for Jonathan and. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even pull up his socks. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan was with us. Um, he that was fifty nine. He was seven. Jonathan was seven years old, and it was the first trip behind the Iron Curtain, nineteen fifty nine. From there on, we went to Russia and Poland, and Hungary, Hungary, Russia. Mm -hmm. No, I think Hungary. Excuse me, I think Hungary was. A few years later, two, two or three years later. This is Czechoslovakia, quite definitely. I think this is Barcelona, one of the Barcelona conferences. Yeah. See, I was already amputated there. Mm -hmm. The dress I'm wearing. This is at the home of Ramon Saron. And this is his wife, Saron's wife. She was a very brilliant woman. Her father died at, when she was 14. And he, her father had edited a magazine on, uh, some scientific magazine, and at 14 she took over the editorship. Quite amazing, and continued it, yeah, Moreno's greeting everybody. This uh, fur wrap, he had me buy that after my amputation to cover up 
the empty sleeve. He thought I, I should have something fashionable and beautiful, mm -hmm. and so that it wasn't so striking that I didn't have long. It was really very beautiful. It was a, a blue fox, a blue mink, a silvery gray, very beautiful. Uh, yeah, this was in Paris at the conference. This is in a movie. We still have that movie, um, Psychodrama of a Marriage, in which this woman, he's the protagonist, the husband, brings the problem that they've been married so long, she's French, she promised she would come to America with him because that's where he wants to be, and he has a mother there, and he wants to be a journalist, and wants to be back in America. And for all these years she's promised, she would come and then doesn't show up. And this is these are the children. Here I am as the nurse. Jonathan is playing as the older boys on the beach, who's throwing sand into his sister's eyes, you know. And I'm I'm telling him you know, he shouldn't be doing that. He was a great role player, John. Mm -hmm. You know, he took his role seriously, yeah. Twelve years old. Oh, this is my, this is oh that's Anchot Saint Berger. And this is definitely Barcelona. They asked me to speak. We were at a, in a television show. Charlotte took me to the television, and afterwards he said to me, "Madame, vous êtes fait pour la TV." <laughs> <laughs> I had to explain <clears throat> psychodrama. This is Czechoslovakia. He's, he is doing teaching, doing something psychodramatic with these women, and she's going to be the wife of one of them. I remember that. I'm not in that picture. Mm -hmm. Czechoslovakia. That's Moreno stepping up on the stage in New York. You can see how short also there that layer is. Um, and I recognize the chairs. This is New York. Mm -hmm. Didn't have space. You see, oval? No, this is a circular one, excuse me. This is the one at 101 Park Avenue. And they're paint. I think this was also being, also intended for Life magazine. Louis Jablonski holding up doing a hold-up, because he worked with criminals, criminal gangs, and uh, Martin Haskell. And, and Lou showing how the young people uh, that he works with, the young criminals, how they do that hold-up. Mm -hmm. Cold. And, 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 and. So I don't know what that is not. I don't know that that's a gun, but, or it was a play gun or whatever. It looks like a gun, but I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Moreno in his intensity explaining something very formidable. You can see how when he was in action he was more real and he didn't look at the camera or wasn't concerned about what was being photographed. Yeah. There he is again. And this is the, um, the well, I think this is the one in New York because it's it's oval. We didn't have enough room for it to extend as a circle or even, yep. Yeah. This is Czechoslovakia. I know this is Czechoslovakia. That's Jonathan. Uh, we had just got him in these uh, lederhosen, a uh, Tyrolean outfit, and he didn't like it. He said, I don't like to show my knees. Um, and so comes, uh, no, the, so then this may have been, this may have been Germany even. Well, because that was so typically German. Yes, this was Mun Munich. In fact, he was our protagonist. Wonderful man. He was half blind. He was fine protagonist. And I now recognize it's Munich because I bought those shoes in Munich. I always tried to buy myself a pair of shoes. I, mean, I was love. I love shoes. Lived, loved them then. They loved them even now. I can't have them. So many. But here, I remember buying these. And that was Jonathan in Munich. And everybody looking at him very lovingly. They gave him that outfit, and mm -hmm. he wouldn't wear it much because of the, he didn't like to show his beanie. My ninis don't like to show my ninis. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a uh, class picture. I think he was eight years old there. One of the things Jonathan has is di deep dimple. He had that as a baby, and you can still see it here mildly. Yeah. Well, he was always pert and alive. That's another glass class picture later. Uh, as a teenager, but his eyes are the same, light and alert. Here I am explaining something to the group and quoting something essential that they, I thought they should know. And 
this is the Beacon Theater. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of my favorite shoes again. <laughs> I found these the easiest because you could slip in, slip in and out of them. That's Dr. Robert Drews from Detroit, who became very good at psychodrama right away and practiced it with great success in his private practice. He had been a musician and he had a little uh, orchestra when he was younger. And he could always get people to play for him and other people couldn't because he realized when he met Moreno because he allowed them to improvise at some point a little cadenza here and there and the musicians wanted that they wanted to be able to improvise at some point to feel that they were the they, they were the creators of the music not just a representation mm -hmm. of the music and he always could get musicians to play for him but he didn't know why until he met Moreno he said ah because I allowed them to be spontaneous at some point in their music. Yeah. Yeah, and here he's telling about the patient he was had been treating. It was very funny. And how he took role reverse and showed the patient with his body how he behaved. And the patient became so alert and said, that's how I act. He said, well, try, let's try it differently this time. So he was reporting this story. Mm -hmm. it was very amusing, very entertaining. Well, he was a, a musician, so he had to deal with the audience. He knew what it was like to relate to a group outside. Fascinating. Very good. Yeah, that's Juan Jasper Mundus again. The Moreno was talking to him, explaining. I don't know where that was taken, to tell you the truth. I even know, even know that picture existed. I can't tell you. doesn't look familiar. Mm -hmm. But as you see, he's always wanting to relate <coughs> to people, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, and make them laugh. Well, this tells me by dividing yourself, these are things we had never printed out, never actually reproduced. We didn't like them enough. He looked so stern there. So he may be working out some problem in his head. <laughs> he was always working, you know. He's, he was always think that he, he actually um, autographed this one. It could be a passport, a picture. <clears throat> it's an older one. It's when I, where he's older. Mm -hmm. And you can see by his hairline and by the way his face and his chin. Um, this was definitely in his later years, but I can't tell you who took it, or why, or what. Oh, no, we had one student who wanted to study photography, and he allowed him to take some pictures, and, and he uh, identified himself in it. So this may well have been one of those pictures that one of his students wanted to study photography. Yeah, I don't like that one at all. So artificial. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this is one of these uh, exotic, I don't know, I can't tell you exactly where. I should believe it was in Cuba, but I can't be absolutely sure. And it could have been Argentina, I'm not sure. Or Spain. Could have been Spain, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Eva Korn took some pictures. She was a photographer, and she was married to Dick Korn, who was one of her students. And she did the one, well, that's it. The double exposure, and she decided to mm -hmm. leave it. Eva Korn did that one. I took that one. That is in Vienna. Dr. Hoff had a, the patient built a theater in which they did not only psychodrama but also drama productions. And it says, von uns für uns, from us, for us. Yeah, the Moreno was delighted to see that. Yeah, this is definitely Cuba because this is the man who came to Beacon to study with us and settled settled in Louisville, Kentucky. His son became a physician here. And this is Cuba. And Moreno is introduced talking about some of the other people. They're all uh, psychiatrists in, in Cuba, not too happy about what was going on. Yeah, this was again in uh, Barcelona. That's Schutzenberger, and that's Obiols, Juan Obiols. Juan Obiols died in uh, Salvador Dali's studio, had a heart attack, and they were great friends. 
Marina is making some remark and, and she's a bit smiling. I don't know who this is. But this is the time when when uh, Sarah said Madame was at Fet Pool TV. Yeah, that was in Beacon, in front of, no, in front, not, uh, no, not Beacon, but uh, Cold Spring. There was this beautiful old tree and a friend of mine took this picture. It's a nice one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was a student of ours, an engineer, worked for a big engineering company um, that makes airplanes down south. Um, and he learned about observing the sociometry of the group. And he went back and observed the whole floor of how people interacted and showed it to his boss. He said, I want you to do this again and, and tell me what, who's relating to whom. So he learned by observing socio sociometrically, but in action, not through a sociometric test. But he was very, his boss was very pleased with what he'd learned from sociometry to see to see who was doing well with whom. Mm -hmm. That's Sarah. Rauchen verboten, no smoking. Um, here you see Napoleon, uh, but names of people, president. So it's one of the, I tell you who this is. I have his book of what the heck is his name? Um, it's, he's in my book, I remember, his, no names are beginning to slip out of my head, especially when I've written. He, he, he survived death camps and wrote a book about it. I have it on my shelf here. Became very well known. Um, formed his own school and told Moreno that when we first met, when we first went to Vienna, came to see Moreno and told him, and sh I listened to an audio recording in which he was using psychodrama. Um, do you want me to look at the fight? No, find later. It can anyway, be. he was very, very uh, admired Moreno mm -hmm. and um, wasn't a psychodramatist, but um, he's a I don't like it when the names escape me and come back and come to me. My thought <coughs> work begins to operate hours later, you know. <laughs> it happens. But he's a well-known psychiatrist, and that's what Ramon Saro. This is definitely Monica over here. Definitely Monica. And this is Jim Ennis, and this is Rojas, and this is Moreno. And here I am in my cape long cape. It wasn't real fur, it was fake fur, mm -hmm. but I liked capes because I covered up my, my shoulder. That's Monica. So I'm not sure... It's Dr. Stalmiro. See? Mm -hmm. Over here? I'm pretty sure that's Stalmiro. Where is that? Talking to Jim Ennis, see? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's Monica, clearly. Moreno is already in the old times. Yeah, he wore this little tiny hat. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe Monica can tell you where that is mm -hmm. from. It may have been from the same time, but I can't be sure. Oh, I was very angry with me because he thought I exerted power over Moreno, which I didn't. I tell you what happened. We were in Buenos Aires, and he had Borges had arranged for a boat trip on the river, which is really very flat, like a like a lake, you know. But Moreno hated boat trips because he'd been very very sick on the way over from Europe, and he thought that all boat trips made people sick. So he, and he, but Borges had arranged for the Ministry of Education to be on the trip. So he comes to pick him up at the hotel, and I tell Moreno it's time to go on the on the boat trip. He said, "I'm not going." Tell him I'm not going. And once Moreno made up his mind, you know that was it. So I had to go right downstairs from the hotel room <laughs> to the lobby <coughs> and try to convince. And Dalmiro was with him. Try to convince him that I'm very very sorry, but Moreno didn't. Could you put that pot back? Oh yeah, it's okay. 
It's okay. It's okay. I see it's okay. Um, to have to convince, to explain to him that he really did feel well enough to go on the ship. I didn't tell him about his scare of being seasick. He didn't know that, the, that this, this river was without a ripple, you know. It, I've seen it. It's huge, but it's not. Like, it doesn't function like a river or like a lake. And he said, I'm not leaving until he comes. So I go back upstairs and the same thing happens. Tell him I'm not going. No way. So they had to have this trip without Moreno. And Rojas never openly accused me, but Don Miro knew that he thought I, it was me, that I poisoned Moreno against him. <laughs> and that it was my power over Moreno <coughs> to say whether mm -hmm. he was to go. I thought to myself, my God, he certainly didn't understand Moreno. I mean, when he was immovable, he was the rock of Gibraltar, for heaven's sake. Mm -hmm. And you had to work your way gently around him from some other position, but not head on. There was no way he would budge. So, I'm afraid I um, innocently upset their relationship, mm -hmm. but it was, it was Rojas' idea, not mine. I don't think he's alive anymore, by the way. He may moved to Spain, but that, and he was active there. But he was always a little bit poisonous about Moreno because of that whole incident. And Del Miro said he... Well, they had to escape, you know, it was so dangerous there. Um, he had to. And another man he brought to Beacon, <coughs> who was a drama director also. That was an interesting story. He brought another man who was involved in the drama. His wife was an actor. And the military got after him because of the kind of plays he produced. And he knew his life was in danger. So he had prepared in his office, a special place where he put his passport to get out. He walked into his office one night and saw these strange men going through his papers, secret service men, except they weren't so secret, he saw them. So he walked around a different way that they didn't know about, grabbed his passport and left and saved his life by going to Spain. It's mm -hmm. a horrible time. Mm -hmm. That's Jim Ennis. I can see that. I don't know where this one is. He's Moreno loved food, so he must be quite happy there. And I don't think that's me, but I can't be sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a patient. He, ma he made that picture in our house, the corner of our house, patient. That's in Madrid, in Barcelona, in Barcelona at the Honoris Causa. There's Staro. These are all people in the medical school. And what Moreno did was he wrote a little piece and he had one Obiol's daughter who knew English very well come over and translate it and coach him in Spanish. So he produced it in Spanish, and he stole their heart for doing that. <laughs> yeah, and that's him delivering his speech. And there he's being, his hand being shaken by Sarah. I think it's Sarah. Yeah, and he's the hands of me, he's handing him his white gloves. He has a beautiful uh, golden ring, massive. Jonathan has it. The hat and his cape was in the. A library in Boston, but they said they didn't. They didn't swear that they could preserve it, or exhibit it. What am I going to do with it? I left it there. But what you, do, you don't have the picture of me sitting listening. I I don't think so. I have a picture <coughs> where I'm sitting over here. He's up there, and you don't see him, and listening. And I'm surrounded by people in black, and I have on a black suit, but a white lace collar and white uh, mm -hmm. cuffs, lace cuffs. And pretty shoes. Let's okay. look at it later. Yeah, and it's we can have it. Yeah, this is definitely Amsterdam, 1971. 
and let me see who I can recognize on the edge. It was an improvised gathering. People came and asked. This is Gretel over here, smiling. Gretel Lloyds. And there, there I am. And as you see, they climbed. The place wasn't big enough. They climbed all over the chairs. And it was in our, in our suite in the hotel. Mm -hmm. In 1971. Oh, here's ha here's Haka, Haka Straub. There she is. And there's Gretel. And this was the occasion. This was Amsterdam, the Amsterdam Congress in 1971. And they came. These two ladies came, and asked Moreno's for Moreno's permission to name their in training institute Moreno Institute, and he gave them their permission. I don't know who, who took this picture, but I'm surprised that Jonathan's at Mophead. Like, that was like the, the Beatles' time, I think. And so that's probably why he had his hair like that. Mm -hmm. and we used to listen to, to Beatles records together. And who are these people? So I don't know who that handsome young man and all that lady. Was Moreno already sick? Um, no, not so much then. He was casually dressed, but I can't say that he was sick. But Jonathan's in, obviously in his teens there. Moreno died when he was 22, so this is a few years before mm -hmm. he died. But you see, he shrunk. See, I'm, I'm getting taller than, got to be taller than he did. Um, but this is Jonathan definitely his beetle years. Yeah, that's the same pic, the same uh, young man who took his picture uh, okay. in our dining room, in our living room, uh, corner of the room. This was one of our favorite chairs when this was a semicircular orange and it turned around. I used to have Jonathan on it and say, we're going on a train ride. And I would go, stop, Cold Spring, Garrison, Ossining, New York, New York, everybody get out. <laughs> and then we go back, and he loved that because. And that chair turned around. I, I mm -hmm. bought that chair because it turned around before he was born. And um, Marina liked the chair too because it fit him very well. But Jonathan uh, enjoyed it only because I played ga played a game with him on a train ride. Yeah, that's about the same time, different corner. That's at the ta no. This is at the dining room table. You see here the telephone. He could reach for it. And look here. Here are all the journals, our journals, right next to where he, where he sits. And I think these are contained, he loved cologne in the older years. And I, he would smell it, I said, why are you doing that? He said, just for a change. <laughs> <laughs> Those were his glasses. Yeah, this is um, when we <coughs> opened the plaque in Faslau. What year was that? I think it was in the late sixties. Yeah. What he what what was touching about this was that Raoul Schindler Raoul Schindler became a very great supporter of Moreno. Met us the first time Moreno went back to Vienna, and I mentioned it in the book. He spoke here and talked about Schindler, and Moreno heard him. And he was so touched by what he said that he had dry sobs. I had it on my, I don't think it's, it's, I have the sound anymore on the tape because they, that, that, that evaporates after a while. But he had dry, because of what Schindler said. Schindler said, it is astounding that in this small, modest house, Moreno built these big ideas. And Moreno was sort of, this is where he lived from the year 1917, 19, 18, excuse me, to 1925, till he came to this country. And that picture that you have the other side is the other side of the house over here. Mm -hmm. I don't know what occasion this was, but it's Moreno, myself, and Hannah. And I think, Hannah never admitted to it, but I think she had a tremendous love for Moreno and never found a mate that had other reasons. Her father was terrible to her. She did not relate to men properly. But I think when he died, she began to die. She died of cancer. And she didn't let me know until 
her cousin, and she never told me. She went through all this with me, but she would not tell me until her cousin called me one day and said, do you know that Hannah is, has metastatic, metastatic cancer? I said, no. And she, by that time, she was already out of it. She was completely, she was under chemo, and she was not in this world anymore. Mm -hmm. She died about two years after he died. And I always wondered, one, once she invited me to come and see her in the hospital, and she was in this terrible dark room. It looked like a basement room somewhere. It was hideous. I don't know why her father didn't give her a decent room, at least. And she had a... On a, you know, you go these things when your hair goes off. Oh, come on, what's it called? You buy these hair pieces. Mm -hmm. I walked in, she said, Look what I look like. She lifted it up and showed me her bare head and plunked it down again. And I thought, She's really out of it. I mean, she was really, really gone. That was, that picture was when she was still intact. But. Well, that's Moreno at one of his enthusiastic welcoming of people at one of the meetings in New York. Well, what do you call these things when you buy the peluca? <coughs> oh, as they call it in French, a peluca. Oh, I, yeah, I don't know how, how you say it in, in, in English. In, in, in Portuguese, it's peruca. Yeah. So you know what it is? Yes. That's yes. It's an artificial too, yeah. piece of hair. Yeah, a hair you... piece. But it's not just a piece, she has a whole thing. Mm -hmm. Women usually have a whole thing. She should have had some of my hair here, huh? Oh, those <coughs> crazy beehives. Well, this was uh, his 80th birthday celebration. See the flowers? And this mm -hmm. was on the stage, you can see it. And we had a blackboard. One of the students was angry and punched our blackboard. <laughs> Not angry at us, but angry in his psychodrama. This was one of the rare occasions when he still came to the theater. This was uh, five years before he died. Yeah. Well, there's Jonathan running. Oh, he's, that's his, here I am, and here's Moreno. Look, Moreno looking up at him. He was making some presentation. Oh, what did he do? Representing the uh, sculpture. The sculptor was a young man who Gretel recommended. He was very talented. He already had a piece in the Louvre at the time. I didn't think that it really conveyed all of Moreno's uh, spirit. But Moreno liked it, and Jonathan was making some remarks <coughs> about it. And he now has this, this sculpture and the plinth that it stands. I'm not sure he has the plinth it stands on. But he has a sculpture mm -hmm. in his Jonathan. in his house. Yes, there it is. Yeah, he said to me, "I made him smiling because he's always smiling," which is true. But the, but the mouth was not quite that way. But it was it isn't bad. Mm -hmm. And I suppose there were moments when Moreno did that too. Mm, he is reading something that he received, and I don't know. Oh, this wasn't an earring, this was a necklace I had. But you see, I wore, I wore a long necklace. I'm sure I thought it was not that one. My earrings on that thing. <laughs> and I was telling, I was smiling, or look, I'm going to tell him something, I don't remember what. That was in Holland when we had the Amsterdam conference. You can see all the canals here. Someone at the uh, conference took his picture. And look, his. Um, Dimple, very deep. Mm -hmm. um, that was in Amsterdam, so he was um, 19 or 20, he was in college. Yeah, this is Barbara's Plaza. That's Bob Soroka and Bob Soroka's wife, Ellen. She's doing something with her hearing, with her uh, earring. Where was it? Uh, it's obviously in his later years again, because <laughs> you can tell the darkening under his eyes. That only happened as he got older. Mm -hmm. Very much older. So this, this is one. Well, he died in seventy-four, age eighty-five. So he may have been eighty or eighty-one there. He wasn't active on the program very much anymore. 
And here we are with Louis Jablonski. But you see Marino's hand? Mm -hmm. Always doing something with, explaining something with his hand. Mm -hmm. I wish we had a clearer one of this. It's one of the nicer pictures. Yeah, the interesting thing is, Hannah brought him this velvet tie, it was wine red, and my suit happened to be exactly the same color, also red velvet. So the wine red velvet, that outfit. Mm -hmm. I like that picture. I already had my hair changed then. So this was, I had my hair fashion changed in 1970, 71. 70, 71 was Amsterdam. No, this was 1970. This was Zurich, I think. The year Zurich what took place. That was Zurich, was 1973. So this was either, this was either 72 or 73 at the conference. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Let us just... And this was before I had a hearing aid. Because since then it's hard for me to wear earrings because it was interfere with the effect of the hearing aid. Mm -hmm. So this would be, if I have a duplicate of this one, clearer. Or they can do that on the, with, the, with the computer. Yes. Um, that would be a nice picture for the book. Yeah, that was done for some specific purpose. Somebody wanted a, uh, an updated picture of him. And this was done also some years before he died. Not too many years. Oh, there I am, okay, with my, with my shorter hairdo. I'll see if you can get the originals and find them in my box. Because you said we've only gone halfway through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that one's too dark to use. I don't think that can be as useful. And it's too partial of him anyway here. But you see how he's already getting darker and darker under the eyes. I don't think he was in very good shape then. And the highlight is my, lo my long earrings, <laughs> reflecting the light. <laughs> yeah. I'll always be with you in Sacramento, J. L. Moreno. I don't know who he wrote that to. I think he loved was... that little hat. He called it his mini hat. The mini skirts had come in. He says, "This is my this is my mini hat." <laughs> ah, there is it. Yeah, beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. And you you are you are making a comment that um, who did this um, this grave for him? Oh yeah. He received this special grave, which by the way, is, these are all writers. All of these are people who are authors, writers. The Austrian Association for Literature wrote to me after he died, could they have his ashes for a special monument? He is being uh, recognized as a pioneer in German, modern German romantic literature for edit, being the editor and, and writer in, writer of the, the Daimon magazine, I have the copies here, and um, in which not only he wrote his material, but also so many other authors who were brilliant and upcoming and young and vigorous in this expressionistic period in Vienna. And it was like a keystone in that period of German literature. And I can show you the, the book. It is very much like that inventory, by the way. Mm -hmm. By the way, where is, where is my inventory? Yeah, it's there. Um, I'll show <coughs> you the book. And mm -hmm. you can photograph it if you like, the cover. Um, it's considered a classic. And years ago, Gretel met a young man who told her that they were reprinted by Krauss reprints in Liechtenstein and he had to read them for his literature studies. So I wrote to the publisher and got a, got a copy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's Jonathan and Leslie, the night they married, dancing together in that suite. That's me looking at J.L. It's 
studying him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the picture that um, Marsha made of me in Devonshire. And I was looking up at two of my boy cousins who live in England and whom I hadn't seen for years. And they came to Devonshire to see me, and I was so happy to see them. So that's what that picture is about. And they, that was used, you know, on the cover of the book. Yeah, this was taken at some conference, and I don't remember which one. I went to so many of them now. I can't remember which one. It was one of the psychodrama conferences. There is Jonathan with me now. There's my library in the background. And he's a professor at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. In the medical school, as well as in the School of Arts and Sciences. And I can show you, I don't know if I've showed you, I'll have to show you that, something very interesting about Jonathan. Um, he teaches, uh, he's very in, in, important in biomedical ethics today. He fought hard for stem cell research to be respected and federally uh, supported. He refused to be lassoed into President Bush's group because he knew they were not. He told me they were not really concerned about patients. Their standards were too conventional, too conservative for him. And he teaches the third grade medical students medical ethics, among other things. Mm -hmm. In the School of Arts and Sciences, he teaches the history of science to the graduate the, the graduate students, I think. Anyway, what I appreciate most about Jonathan is how he made his own way, created his own his identity separate from his father and me, which was the best thing that ever happened to him. When he became a sophomore in college, he called me. And he said, Mother, what would you say if I majored in philosophy? Now, I didn't know that he was planning uh, earlier to major in psychology and take Beacon, take over Beacon, which I think would have been a disaster, stepping in his father's footsteps. I've seen that happen with sons of, of uh, known fathers. It's no good. They can never evade their, their shadow. Mm-hmm. And I said, I think that's wonderful. It gives you a broad stage for you from which you can take on anywhere in life. I supported him wholeheartedly. Get away from that past history. You don't need it. You're a person in your own right. And he's made a tremendous success. If you'd like, if you, I'll go and show you. Do you want <coughs> to show this? In when we finish. When we finished. Okay. Mm-hmm. He has flown all over the world. He's been twice to Beijing. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, that's one of those things that, that <laughs> oh, you made me make funny faces. I didn't, didn't much care for them, by the way. I don't like any of these pictures particularly, I have to tell you. That's maybe only one that passes my, my uh, critique. Well, there again, you see, you don't have the rest of me. Cut me off, so it's not well posed. Although it is nice about the books. And you see, my my circle dark, dark, circles are darkening. I should make sure I should cover those up next time you photograph me. <laughs> okay. That's it. <laughs>